All right, so we're live. Welcome to uh, the Awesome Dynamics show. My name is Paul DeWarian with Awesome Dynamics. With me, we have a special guest today. We have Miles Anderson with Bright Local, and he's uh, graciously joined us today to talk a little bit about uh, different things and uh, different questions that we have for him, interview questions that we have for him uh, pertaining to SEO. Uh, if you don't know who Miles is, uh, you should, because he's with uh, BrightLocal.com, a company that we use religiously for all of our SEO clients. And if you do any consulting with us, we're we're telling you to use their company for the the rank tracker uh, reporting that they have, the citation tracker reporting that they have. A lot of other uh, aspects of their software is just really powerful and necessary if you're going to be serious about your SEO program. So with that, I want to let Miles tell you a little bit more about his business. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Miles. Okay, thanks, Paul. Uh, and thank you for that lovely introduction. And also for using Bright Local uh, and recommending us. Really, uh, really appreciate it. So, um, as you can tell, um, I have an English accent, uh, so I am from the UK. Uh, I've been running a company called Bright Local since 2009, and we are a specialist local search reporting, monitoring, and citation platform. Essentially what we do is we provide uh, critical data on all things related to local search, so things like your search rankings, be it on Google, Google Maps, uh, mobile, sort of Bing and Yahoo and their local platforms, through to tracking citations on a huge range of sites, uh, auditing information such as your name, address, and phone number on those sites. Uh, then we do um, reporting for, um, for reviews and star ratings. We also monitor uh, Google My Business profiles. And we've just done some recent integrations with Google Analytics uh, and also Twitter and Facebook. So what we have now is a platform that pulls together and aggregates all these data points which are all critical for anyone who's serious about local search and present them back in a nice, neat dashboard interface so you have all that data uh, kind of grouped into one place. We primarily serve agencies and SEOs, so we've got about 2,000 agency and SEO clients across the world, but we also serve local businesses uh, uh, directly as well. But we have an agency background, so we kind of understand the pressures and um, uh, the kind of challenges that agencies face, and we've kind of built our software to act as a kind of back-end platform that agencies can use. So everything can be white label, we operate behind the scenes. Uh, and as well as doing the software side, we also have a server side, which is we provide um, sort of citation build-up and cleaning, uh, as well as now data aggregator submissions uh, for companies who want to kind of clean up their local listings. Uh, and we've been doing that for a long, long time. Um, we've got a highly trained team actually based in our own office in the Philippines uh, who, who manage that. So we're, we're kind of a hybrid business. We're part software, part service, but we're here to serve the agency and freelance market as well as SMBs. Fantastic. That was a great intro, and I can comment on the dashboard. We're actually rolling that out to our clients I believe this upcoming Monday. Uh, we were really looking forward to, uh, to that. In fact, I remember commenting on your forum about a, uh, I think it was about a year ago when you had started talking about it. And I really love how the analytics data is right in there. It, they have the, uh, the the Facebook and Twitter integration that you're putting in there. I think is really cool to have that available. Uh, and I think I was talking to one of your folks in the, in the chat about making some of the, we do a lot of uh, extra rank uh, ranking reports uh, based in certain towns to just help our clients find out where they're doing in their local uh, uh, cities or, or neighborhoods in their uh, more urban environment. And that's just uh, yeah, something that you're, it's on your roadmap, and I think it's going to be a great place for a person to go to this one place to see all these different things rather than having all these different links that we used to send them every single week. So I'm just really excited yeah. to see what our clients say about that. Okay, that's great. I really hope so too. Please feedback. We've got some other, uh, a lot of other updates coming. We've actually doubled the size of our development team so that we can really start to speed up the output uh, of kind of new features, improvements, uh, new interfaces, functionality. So uh, we've got a very busy roadmap. I'm an incredibly impatient uh, individual, so things can't come fast enough for me. I have to rein myself back in a little bit, but uh, you'll see some, some really good new developments, some quite unique stuff coming through in the next few months. Cool. To, to quote one of my clients that's actually a customer of yours, uh, he always says on our consulting calls, step on the gas. And that's that's yeah. what you're doing with your development team. All right. Well, we, we've got some questions prepared for you uh, sure. pertaining to some, some different things that are happening in SEO today. And we're really curious to see what your perspective is on some of these different things. So we'll start with our, our first question, which is, uh, what are some of the trends and predictions you see coming in uh, 2017 pertaining to SEO and citations? 
Sure. So uh, I'm a local specialist. So a lot of my answers will be kind of geared towards kind of local search and businesses that are physical businesses that attract their customers from a, from a local area, as say opposed to a large e-commerce platform uh, or to say a travel uh, a travel business travel website. Um, so I think there are a number of trends that we kind of see coming through. I think the first one that's been noted in the last couple of years is how much harder it is um, for local businesses to rank in uh, local search these days. And the reason for that is it's getting much more competitive. A lot more businesses have got their act together uh, and got themselves much better optimized. And they've raised the bar for what it takes to rank high up uh, in the uh, in kind of local search results. At the same time, Google's algorithm is morphing and changing, becoming more sophisticated. And also, the organic algorithm, which delivers organic results, and also the local al algorithm are becoming much more uh, intertwined. And organic factors are having a much bigger play in the local results, in the ranking local results that, uh, that get uh, returned in search. So um, it is getting more competitive, and I think it's only going to continue. Um, and as it gets more competitive, um, uh, another trend is uh, more emphasis on location. Now, when you're talking about local search, it's kind of obvious that location is going to be a big factor. But as Google builds up, um, uh, in one way, its own database of businesses, because more businesses are getting their act together and getting optimized, Google's moving to um, essentially a hyper-local search as opposed to local search. And what we're seeing is that they're narrowing down the radius of which they return results in the maps. So for businesses that, say, are on one side of the city that used to show up the searches done in the center of that city or on the, you know, the eastern end of it, they're not showing up anymore because Google is moving from a local or a city level down to a neighborhood level in terms of the results uh, that it's returning. So location is becoming much more of an important factor, uh, and therefore getting your location signals maximized and your location authority maximized in the business is absolutely crucial. And we can talk about some and tactics that will, uh, will deliver that. Um, and also, this, this sense of location becomes more important. It gets even more important when you start to think about mobile and the fact that a lot of consumers are going from desktop to mobile in terms of the time they spend consuming media, but also the searches you're doing. The number of searches done on mobile now outstrips the number of searches done on desktop. Um, and a lot of those searches are very, or a great number of those searches have what's called a local intent. I think it's about a third, 30% or so of those searches have what Google calls a local intent, which means searchers want to see local information, they want to see local results and map results, and therefore Google returns local results more frequently to mobile searches than it does to desktop searches. Now, if you're a local business here in this, or someone who, who works in local SEO, that's great news, because there's more opportunity uh, for your business or your client's businesses to get shown up to kind of mobile consumers. Um, but there's obviously the factors that you need to do in terms of to make sure that your business is kind of geared well for mobile. You could have a mobile optimized site. You know, that's almost kind of give you some skin in the game. But more importantly, you should really start to think about the behavioral differences of users, how they're using search, the information they want. They're much more impatient generally than desktop searches. Uh, and so people, I think, as local businesses, as Google does, need to have a mobile first strategy. You know, when I'm building my website, let's think about mobile users, mobile platform first. Uh, and kind of gear it towards that. That's where consumers are moving, and that's where Google is also putting uh, its attention. I think for another big trend that's coming through, uh, we're seeing what's called kind of pay to play. So a um, bit of background, uh, Google uh, has invested a lot of money in building its local platform uh, and building its maps platform, but it's really struggled to engage smaller uh, local businesses in AdWords to kind of get the same amount of spend out of them than it does out of larger, you know, more enterprise or e-commerce businesses. Uh, even it rolled out its own AdWords Express product, which is a kind of stripped back version of AdWords, super simplified, that'd be really easy for, for local businesses to use. They've struggled to get the same level of kind of cut through and take up they would like. So they're basically investing a lot but not making enough money. And so to try and tip the balance there, what they're doing is they're, they're taking away what has up until now been kind of free natural promotion and replacing it with paid solutions. So we're seeing paid adverts coming into the local pack. We're seeing pay-for-lead initiatives in the home services market kind of in the U.S. And I think we'll see this trend continue uh, if the results of those sort of tests are positive because Google needs to make some money. Similarly, with Amazon, they've entered into the arena now. They've got their own home services pay-per-lead product. And, you know, from July speak to the expectation is that when Facebook gets its local product, you know, really humming, they'll look to have a sort of pay-per-lead approach or some sort of paid promotion. And similarly with Apple, all these businesses that are investing money need to start getting money back out of their... Um, uh, their sort of local product. So uh, I think understanding that paper that that paper play movement and how to um, make the best use of it, uh, but also to how to develop other channels um, that mean your your kind of your sort of funnel of leads doesn't dry up uh, is going to be very important moving forward.
So that probably covers the, the trends I think will uh, will shape the next 12 months. Well, thank, thank you for that. I have a follow-up question. With all you know, the talk of the, the pay-for-play, do you intend on having anything in the Bright Local interface uh, to track some of that information in the dashboard? Um, we may do. We do We do have a, a kind of lightweight PPC tracking uh, engine uh, that tracks just normal sort of PPC placements. Um, but as and when the, um, the kind of ads, the local pack rolls out, uh, we will start to, uh, to sort of flag those up. Some of the things that we've got coming down the pipe for our rank tracker is one is we're going to start uh, incorporating keyword query volumes into there so you see the number of searches happening uh, for different keywords and also start to flag up whether there are um, uh, video results and map results for certain keywords. So one thing we might add in addition to that is is there a local pack ad um, being displayed. Fantastic. Yeah, one of the biggest things from an agency perspective is, you know, it, it just gets, obviously the clients want to see a return on investment, and that ultimately is how many phone calls or, or leads am I getting through my website. But to move back a few levels, if we can show them traffic and rankings, uh, that is usually something, I think you had the survey, you know, what do clients care about most? And, yeah. I, and the top two things were the number of contacts and the rankings. And they don't care about the traffic, but if, if we can consolidate as much information into a dashboard where they can see stuff very easily in one place, that just makes our jobs much easier as uh, agencies, and then we're able to focus on getting the work done rather than uh, reporting all the time. So I do appreciate this dashboard tremendously. That's correct to hear. Good. Fantastic. Uh, well, my next question was the... Uh, content freshness. We had a question on this. How much is uh, too much and too little? And Robin, I'll let you uh, elaborate on that just a little bit if you would. Sure. So in terms of content freshness, uh, there's a lot of sites that will have archives and we just wanted to know when um, is there too much information on there and when you should uh, slim down your archives and how often you should update your content uh, when you're a local site um, and you know how many blogs should you be doing and uh, landing pages or updating your actual service pages and uh, how much freshness is Google really looking for? Uh, okay, so let me, let's, I guess, kind of break down the answer. So let me talk about, uh, say, kind of blog pages, uh, sort of first of all. Looking at this from well, from our perspective as a business, you know, we, we use content heavily uh, as a mechanism for communicating with our, with our customers. And every time we uh, do a bit of research or, or you know, write an article, it gives us an opportunity to reach out to our customers, to reconnect with them, to remind them that we're here, uh, and also to um, remind them that you know, we are a great source of uh, insights and research that can help them do their job. So, um, and we know that works very well from uh, an engagement perspective, bringing people back into the site. Uh, but also in establishing us as kind of thought leaders in the kind of local search industry and also as a valuable, uh, reliable and kind of trustworthy partner in terms of we do a lot of um, kind of content on things that we don't sell. So, you know, we don't just publish content around the, you know, the relatively narrow set of products we have. We look at other issues that are affecting our customers and we look to do research that will help them answer questions about how to run their agencies better or how to grow an agency doing case studies from other people who've grown from freelance to consult. And so, I think it's very important for any business to understand why um, they're writing uh, their, con their content, you know, what their objectives uh, of that content is. I think just you know, thinking, oh my god, we've got to have some content, let's just run anything up there, uh, is a terribly um, time-consuming and wasteful uh, approach to, uh, to take. You know, the web is awash with so much thin, relatively you know, me-too, samey content, but I think just to move it out there doesn't necessarily give a business uh, what it wants. I think a business needs to understand why it's writing, who it's writing for, and what their audience um, uh, kind of wants to know about it. Um, in terms of how many things you should write, well, some people say, you know, look at your competitors and see how much they're writing and then write a little bit often. I don't tend to agree with that. I think you should basically communicate when you've got something useful to say, you know. Um, communicate, you know, if you write one post a month and it's fabulously detailed and incredibly insightful and useful, then that's probably enough. You know, if you have the capacity as a business to write two or three things that are useful for your audience, then, then do that. Um, just avoid the sort of mud, the mud swinging uh, tactic. Uh, in terms of freshness, I mean, there's nothing I think more troubling and disconcerting is when you go to a, a business website, you go to their blog, and the last post is six months ago. It's a bit like, you know, hey, where did the people go? <laughs> you know, it's a bit like going to an abandoned building, 
You know, are there any signs of life? A blog is a blog gives a website its pulse uh, and, a, and a sign of life. So you know, if you don't, if you're a local business and you, there's just no way you've got the capacity, the resource, or the desire to write a blog, just get rid of it in the first place. Don't even don't even admit to doing nothing. Just kind of get rid of it. But if you have the capacity to write something, then make sure you write at least once a month. And you know, that gives your your site some sign of life. That gives a reassurance to a digital customer that, that your business is kind of functioning uh, and kind of being looked after, and is, you know, has got some you know, management uh, management behind it. Um, in terms of um, kind of refreshing, say, your landing page content, like your sort of service pages. I mean, some people believe that you should update the content so that Google reindexes and recrawls it. Again, if your service has changed, then update it. You know, if you've if you've got the ability to surface reviews into those pages, then kind of do that. Um, I don't think they need to be dramatically rewritten uh, and redeveloped. You might want to build new service pages for a wider set of areas if your business expands or if you expand the range of sort of services that you go to. Um, so I think it's more about what is the business need and what do you need to communicate what the business does rather than, rather than this necessity to uh, have fresh content kind of coming out the whole time. I mean, as an agency, I know, you know, of my days with a range of customers in different industries, you know, some of them embraced kind of writing content, uh, and some of them just thought it was the most horrific idea possible, and you know, they had no idea where to start. They were sort of almost terrified of the prospect of doing that. So I think part of it is the, the problem of communicating the value uh, of kind of writing content and setting up a schedule where it can be done consistently uh, and practically moving forward at a, at a rate that that particular business is kind of comfortable with producing. Yeah, that's that's a strategy I constantly recommend to clients all the time is build something into your regular schedule. Uh, the yeah. one way we do that is a webinar every single week, and we specifically pick topics that we want to create videos on and put those on the blogs we already have or create content based on the videos. So every blog that's coming out has a video on it that goes into a lot of discussion and depth on each one, and we've made it just part of our regular every single week thing. And we've worked with clients that just have to sit down in front of a camera once a week and talk about things. Or when they go to events, just, just take pictures and jot a few notes down. And that could be you know, the beginnings of your blog content. So I, yeah, I, I love that you reinforce the idea that it doesn't have to be something that you have to uh, go out of your way to do. Just think about what you're already doing every single week and see if there's just one little thing that you can change to document what you're doing. And then you can take that documentation and turn it into content. So. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a mindset. You know, it's kind of getting to the habit of doing it, uh, mm -hmm. and also having a process so that you know you've got your you know your webinar process seems pretty slick now. You know what you're doing. Everyone understands the kind of role they play, and therefore the the, the, the time it takes to produce it has been cut down dramatically because you've come proficient and professional at doing it. And you know you know the earlier you adopt that and the better you plan for it, you know the easier it's going to be down the line. Fantastic. Uh, at this point, I'd like to take a quick pause and do a promotion for both of our businesses, for those that are watching uh, the video. So, Miles, what's the best way for someone to get in contact uh, with you or engage with Bright Local uh, for the different services that you offer? Uh, well, we have, uh, we have pretty much 24-hour around-the-clock support. We have support agents in the U.S., U.K., uh, and also in the Philippines. So we cover off pretty much all hours. Uh, contact at brightlocal.com is, uh, is the best email address to go to. Uh, you can also come direct to me. I'm Miles, which is M Y L E S, uh, at brightlocal.com. Uh, or we have a live chat function on the site. So just go to brightlocal.com, uh, look for the chat chat box in the bottom right hand corner, uh, and uh, you should find uh, that there's an agent on hand uh, to kind of answer any questions you've got. We also do uh, live demos as well. So we have uh, a team who provide kind of free one to one uh, demos. They tend to last about 20 minutes, 30 minutes. They're kind of tailored for what what you want to know, which part of our services can kind of meet your particular needs. Um, and so uh, if you kind of like what you hear you know, today or you have an initial chat and it seems to tick some of the boxes, if you want to know a little bit more, then definitely sign up for one of our one-to-one uh, -one demos. Great. And then I'm going to have our Director of Sales, Terry, do a quick promo for us, and then we're going to get right on to the next question. Terry, do you want to uh, talk a little bit about Awesome Dynamic? Of course I do. Thank you, Paul. So Awesome Dynamic, we are in the business of getting you new targeted customers. And uh, we always like to say our customers call us. We want yours to call you as well. So we do that by doing responsive web design. 
We do that with search engine optimization, which is one of the things we're discussing here today. Also, we are an Amazon seller consultant, so we help people get on Amazon or improve their Amazon presence and increase their sales that way as well. Uh, featuring Google virtual tours as well, which is a great way for people to preview your business, as well as to get a nice little SEO bump, especially if, as we have been talking here, your competition isn't doing it and you are, that's going to give you some good help there. So we are available at awesomedynamic.com. I am, as Paul said, our director of sales. I can be reached at Terry at awesomedynamic.com. Love to talk to anybody who's interested in getting more new customers. All right. Thank you, Terry. So back to you, Miles. I wanted to ask real quick. Uh, those virtual tours, uh, from your experience, we, we are a trusted agency and we do them. It isn't really the biggest part of our business by any means, but we do uh, help businesses locally. And a lot of the folks that we do help uh, nationally, we have the trusted independent photographers uh, you know, go out and shoot their business and attach that to the Google My Business listing. Just curious what your perspective is in terms of you, know, you have all these rank trackers that are out there and you have a, uh, a lot of folks that, uh, that you work with other agencies. What are you seeing from that perspective in terms of those Google virtual tours helping uh, folks move up in the rankings versus their competition? I know I put you on the spot. This wasn't a question. Yeah, that's all right. Uh, and and, uh, and I'll, I'll put my hands up and say um, I don't have any kind of clear concrete evidence that, that it makes a difference and I haven't read um, any posts from other people to say that those tools uh, make a difference to where you rank. Certainly they do make a difference in terms of um, giving people an insight into your business and what you do uh, and we've known from various studies that we've done looking at the trust factors that things like um, sort of photos give a particular business, you know. If you use, you know, uh, kind of clip art and you put a photo of a, of a, a fake plumber on your site, uh, or you replace that picture with a picture of you, you know, plying your trade, standing with your van, um, that gives you much credit credibility having a picture of you, uh, because it gets people to understand there's a real human behind it, they see your face, they get to, uh, you know, people love looking at people's faces, we're, we're all, we love kind of human contact, so the more you can represent you as, as your business and the personality, the more people are going to trust it uh, and like it. So I think the good thing about these kind of virtual tools is that, particularly if it's a, uh, say a kind of lifestyle uh, sort of business, it's a cafe or a restaurant, somewhere where you're going to spend some time sitting around, uh, then it's great because you get a real sense of what it's going to be like, the ambiance, the atmosphere. It's invaluable. We want that information, and um, it gives, gives them the chance to kind of make a more qualified choice about the, the sort of business that they choose. Similarly, we've done some stuff for... Um, companies as a, as a vet, for example, and they had a, a kind of shop uh, within their sort of pet store, and um, uh, I saw some great, some great videos, just, just basically kind of walking around and showing showing the environment, you know, you wouldn't really kind of worry and say about what, you know, what a pet store was like, or what a sort of uh, kind of veterinarian's office was going to be like, but it allowed somebody to get a bit more flavor for their particular business and the kind of people behind it, and I think all you're trying to do is really convince customers more and more to use you, or to pick you than someone else, and so doing something like that really can't harm your ability uh, to attract people. Um, but if the, your competitors are doing it and you're not, that might be something that sways people to be towards choosing them over you. Uh, and they don't cost a lot, and um, I think they can be, you know, really enhance the, the kind of portrayal of your business online. So I encourage, uh, you know, businesses to do that as much as possible. Yeah, it, the one thing that I always tell people is there's two sides of SEO. There's the technical piece and all the different technical things you need to do to try and get yourself up in the in the rankings. But then I always talk about the human side and how people feel when they come to the come to the website, uh, how they feel about your business, what, what your story is, you know, real pictures of people rather than the stock photography. Uh, all those different things really help compel that person to want to reach out and contact you and increase that conversion rate. And that's where I think uh, we even had a, a, an attorney that wanted to get uh, a Google virtual tour because he wanted to m have people understand I'm not just working out of a home office, I'm actually working out of a, a formal office building. So this way it brought some more credibility to his yeah. particular situation. Um, because when, when I first uh, learned about it, I'm like, oh, this would be great for restaurants and some of the different venues. I even thought from the perspective of, uh, you know, cruise ships should have these things where I can go through and, and look at the cruise ship. I thought that would be cool. 
or even a, a multi-location business. Yeah, I used to work for a company where I had to go to different locations, and I always wondered how many outlets were on the wall uh, because we were setting up computers. And it would be handy to just be able to tour the facility and, and take a look. So there's certainly a lot of other uses other than ranking factor where they where they can come in. But I think that human side of SEO really letting people into your doors uh, virtually could could have an impact. Yeah, uh, I think, I think oh. that, that kind of goes beyond that in terms of when people are kind of building a new website or designing a site. You know, um, Google wants to deliver the best search experience, the best online experience for searches. You know, it wants to send them to websites where users are going to have a good experience. Um, and so as a, as a business owner of an agency, you know, when you're trying to convince clients to to think about how they should think about their site, it really should be a user-first experience rather than you know, a Google-first experience. Obviously, you don't want to ignore the indexability uh, and the need to have content that Google can hook into and understand what you did and turn back. But in terms of the information you put front and center, in terms of the interactivity, the styling of it, it should absolutely be from you know, a user-first perspective. And also, Google is now, obviously, um, putting more stock in behavioral factors the way users interact with your website online, how long they spend on the site, whether they search, go to your website and bounce back. That all gives Google indication of the experience that a searcher is having or a, a, a user is having on your website. And if they see that web users are engaging more on a site, they are doing more things like kind of click to call, taking actions to, to follow up from having visited the website, that gives Google signals to say, okay, people like this website, or at least they're showing me they like it by spending longer on it. They're viewing more pages. They're not bouncing back. And that gives Google real insight into whether users are getting the information they want and liking what they find. Um, and that's probably going to become more and more a part of Google's um, kind of algorithm kind of moving forward. And so I think any businesses looking to redesign a site or refresh their site must look at it from a user-first perspective. Awesome. I uh, want to move right on to our next question here okay. in regard to link building techniques and reporting. One tool that we use with some of our clients that are getting to the link building phase of their SEO program, uh, we, we use a tool called Ahrefs. I don't know if you're familiar with that specific tool. Yeah, sure yeah, All right. So that's something that you know, I, I could see that being a valuable uh, add-on in terms of being able to ev evaluate the what, what we call the link diversity or portfolio of links that uh, that folks have in the different types, et cetera. Just wanted to know if you had any plans to incorporate that into uh, into the different service offerings that you had. Sure. Uh, so yeah, links are very important. And as I said earlier, the, the organic algorithm, the local algorithm are coming together. And links is actually probably the, the, you know, has the biggest, highest correlation between high local ranking and links. So links are important for local uh, as, well as, uh, as well as organic ranking. Um, we, we do some research into links because we know our, our customers are interested in it. And we've done some linking at, you know, what are the best sources of local links. Uh, and citations came out on top, uh, by the way, of that. But we don't provide a link module. And the reason we don't provide it is that there are companies like Ahrefs uh, or Majestic SEO uh, that, frankly, just do an absolutely terrifyingly awesome job uh, of that. You know? And that's all they do. They're specialists. And they go extremely deep. We've got vast crawlers, incredible analysis to the functionality. And um, we've, we've looked at it, and we thought, you know what? We can never specialize like that. You know, we're a broader business. You know, we, we're, we're, we're sort of local specialists. So I think if we did it, we just do a, you know, a job that's nowhere near as good as what those guys would do. And I think you know, customers like you who use us and them, I don't think you'd stop using them just because we had a link module. You know? And we don't have the luxury of being able to invest all our attention and efforts in, in, in that kind of link module that the likes of Ahrefs and Majestic SEO can do. So for us, yeah, that's not, a, that's not a, you know, a bullet that we're going to bite um, because I don't think we can do a better job than the other guys out there. We prefer to, spe we prefer to focus on our specialists of local search. You know, we want to deepen our, uh, our kind of tracking and routing of Google My Business, uh, look at building a, a really, really functional and strong Google My Business duplicate finder. Uh, we also want to build a better, bigger, faster citation and NAP uh, auditing platform. Uh, which we're doing at the moment, which will be very exciting uh, when uh, when that kind of gets launched. So, yeah, we're not going to go and try and have the link fight because we think there's some guys doing a fantastic job of it already. Um, so we're going to focus on what we believe is our specialism and make our platform more functional in those particular kind of local search-related areas. Cool. And any any tips for those watching in terms of link-building techniques that you would specifically recommend? 
Um, I mean, if you, we've got some research that uh, we've only polled around four or 500 SEOs to find out what they thought um, the best link building tactics work. Um, for us, it's all about content. It's all about brand awareness and building up some authority. Uh, so we publish a lot of research. Um, and what the research does for us is quite good is it gives us unique data points, you know, because like, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of sort of samey me too content out there. People doing sort of five top tips or 10 top tips around particular things. Uh, whereas we tend to be more kind of data driven. Uh, and we're doing a study at the moment looking at the impact of, um, of star rating reviews on kind of click through rates and within search. Uh, you know, we've got a consumer panel of around 4,000 uh, consumers uh, that we're getting to kind of sort of feed into that. And that gives us some really nice, unique data points, publish a nice bit of content about it, probably do a webinar about it. That gets lots of kind of backlinks kind of coming to us. So it does, does take some effort to kind of produce that and to, you know, and uh, can be a little bit of expense kind of goes into it as well. Um, but certainly, if you who want some other tactics, go and have a look at this post on brightlocal.com uh, around link building for local search. Uh, and it's got some kind of good quotes from some SEOs in there as well. Cool. Uh, next question I'm really excited to ask you, uh, being excited about SEO, us, uh, us SEO people. Yeah. Um, the, what's the deal with Yext? Uh, you know, we, see, we see that they're getting more and more involved with uh, controlling some of these different citation directory listings that are out there. Uh, it's becoming more difficult to figure out how to get around uh, using them. Uh, you know, we, we, we do a lot of training. We train a lot of our clients how to do their own citations. And a lot of them come back to us and say, shouldn't I just do Yext? And uh, we've, we've done a lot of uh, research, uh, several folks across the Internet authorities in the SEO world, and a lot of them are still saying, no, uh, you should just you know, try and do your best without them. Uh, but if, if you're absolutely looking to get one, one done that, uh, that you can't get to on your own, um, you know, maybe you could add it to your, uh, to your portfolio of different things that you're doing. But at the, at the end of the day, a lot of these business owners are really looking to uh, save money. So if there's a, yeah, the, the idea of a monthly fee just to manage the citations that Yext controls uh, can be a, a costly, ongoing, recurring expense for some folks uh, that they really uh, don't want to take on because there's a lot of other things other than citations they need to be working on anyhow. So I'd like to get your reaction uh, to the whole uh, Yext question um, and, and, and what you think about it. Sure. So, yeah, they do. They have uh, taken control over a number of key sites. It's not that many, actually. Uh, they've got complete lockdown of, but they are some of the sort of larger sites. Um, and essentially, they're offering a revenue stream to these directories, uh, which are struggling to replace their old kind of yellow pages, paper promotion revenue streams that they uh, that they had evolved. So these businesses are looking, you know, to make more money so they can kind of keep the doors open. So you can understand why they've done it. And Yext has got a pretty big checkbook, so uh, it's writing some pretty big, uh, pretty big checks. Because it's writing these big checks, they have to have pretty high price points. So they charge businesses a fair, well, I think, it's about a very high amount of money uh, for the service they provide. Um, considering that within their network, you know, there's probably about 50% of pretty low-value, kind of low-grade sites in there. So you're really paying that huge amount of money just to, to three or four of the key sites that uh, that you really want. Um, there isn't a way to kind of get around that. They have kind of got it kind of pretty well locked down. I and mean, I always think of the Yex as the is the the PPC of citations. You know, uh, you kind of pay for it, and suddenly you get access to all these sites, and you're up there. But as soon as you stop paying, all your content gets removed, uh, and you've basically kind of lost. You've got no kind of residual long-term value having invested in Yext. You just have to kind of keep on paying to kind of keep on kind of maintain that promotion uh, and that um, that kind of content and information uh, within uh, within those sites. So um, I don't know, Yext seems to be kind of looking at you know uh, other sort of platforms and investing more. In it's um, it's kind of beacons and it's kind of actual kind of sort of physical kind of retail. To the side of its sort of business, so um, I always think it's that their their listings management and power listings is going to be their, their kind of cash cow that allows them to invest in other areas, um, and they're very aggressive from a kind of sales sales perspective. And I think they had a value if you're a big business with lots of locations and you haven't got the resources and manpower to 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 look after it yourself. You know, they can provide a kind of one stop solution um, that can save you a lot of time. It does cost a lot of money, but can save you save you a lot of time. It was interesting research came out. Uh, I think it was by, done by Darren Shaw, um, that looked at um, some tests where they did manual site submissions for three, for three new businesses, aggregated submissions, uh, and then the Yext submissions. And they looked after three months to see how many 
listings had made it through to the end directories. And I think the overwhelming result was that um, manual submissions drove um, or delivered the most number of listings at the lowest price. Then there was Yext with, I think, a similar number of listings but a much higher price. And then aggregators was lagging fairly far behind in terms of actually delivering new listings um, for for those particular sort of new businesses. So um, we're a firm believer in manual citations. Uh, we've done that for a long time. Uh, it needs to be done correctly. It's quite laborious and time consuming. And uh, you know, uh, I wonder how your local your local business owners sort of feel about that. I think uh, you know, people can really sort of pull their hair out when they're starting to uh, to kind of get into it. So hopefully, we're a service that they can use to uh, to kind of shortcut that. We are a lot. Uh, a lot cheaper than uh, than Yext is. Uh, we also just launched a, an aggregator uh, distribution uh, piece as well, so you can buy aggregator submissions as well as manual submissions uh, through us. Um, so in terms of the, the big Yext question, um, they've got a big checkbook. They're paying these sites a lot of money. They're going to be around for a while. Um, some sites have reverted away from Yext, having complete control of them. Uh, I think MapQuest was completely locked down by Yext. Uh, isn't isn't anymore. Um, Will other sites go that way? Will Yahoo, for example, go that way? Uh, we'll have to see. I expect that um, Yext's appetite to pay for exclusivity might drop at some point, uh, and that might open the door uh, for, for, for business owners and for other services to be able to tackle those sites uh, one by one. Uh, Miles, would you talk a little bit more? And I have Robin was going to follow up with uh, a question on that, but I want you to go ahead and uh, promo your, um, your your service to actually do those manual citations through Bright Local just a little bit more, so people understand exactly what that is and how that works. Yeah, sure. So citations for those of you who are scratching your head um, is essentially a listing for your business uh, on the internet. And by a listing, I mean it's your business name, your address, your contact details, your phone number maybe a description, a list of the services, all that kind of stuff that is your, you know, your kind of ID card uh, for your business. And that can get onto sites like Yelp.com, very large, well-known brand sites with, with kind domain authority, or it could be niche sites for your industry. It could be health grades if you're in the medical industry. It could be Arvo if you're in a, uh, if you're in a, um, a legal business, um, or it could be you know, plumbers.net uh, if you're a plumber. There's a whole range and sway of different uh, national sites, regional sites, local sites, and also to uh, so the industry, to the specialist sites. And um, what you want to do is essentially is get your business accurately and collect correctly listed on a number of those sites. Um, the benefit of doing that is that some of those sites can get great targeted traffic. You know, Arvo is a highly specialized legal site. Um, people will go to that to find specialist lawyers in their area of particular specialisms. You can imagine that's a great source of high converting traffic, high uh, intent leads coming through there. And then you've got more sort of general broader sites like yp.com, which are looking for a whole sort of range of uh, sort of services. So they can act as, um, as a direct source of leads, but probably more, more importantly to that, that kind of Google looks to these sites to essentially confirm and kind of corroborate the information it has about you. So if Google's got you know, you, your particular name and address, it needs to know with some accuracy that that, that that data is correct. The best way it does that is to kind of check against some other sites that it thinks have good quality data uh, and it trusts. And that's what you're doing, essentially putting your data on these other sites so that Google can verify its data against and say, yep, I'm absolutely happy that I understand what this business is called, what it provides, and where it's located, and therefore I'm more confident about returning this particular business for certain search terms. And so what that means is you get, you get and get a boosting uh, in, the, uh, in the local search results by having more of these citations. Now, when you build citations, there's a number of ways you can do it. The old-fashioned way, which is, I think, still the best, uh, is to go one by one to each of these sites and submit your data. When you're doing that, you can be sure the data that you're uploading is accurate and correct. You can also claim ownership and verify that listing, which means if you're, you said you become the owner of it, which gives it a much le higher level of trust um, within, the, within that particular directory. That directory is also getting its data from other sources. It might be scraping some sites. It might be buying a data feed from an aggregator. But when it's comparing that data against the data supplied by the business owner who's claimed to verified it, it's going to give more of that value authority to that claim uh, and verify direct, um, uh, directly by the business. Um, you can also go to data aggregators, which are big companies that basically get lots of information about local businesses and then distribute that out to a wider network of sites. Uh, and in the US, there are four big data aggregators that do that. And the benefit of doing that is that you do a kind of blast of your information out to as many points on the web as possible. Uh, and that can be great to kind of clean up 
any kind of widespread irregularities or errors that you've got in your data, and make sure that you can get into things like some hard-to-reach mobile apps, uh, into some uh, sort of mapping solutions uh, as well. I think there tends to be a, a good hybrid approach there of using the aggregators to get wider distribution. Also, it takes a little bit longer for their data to kind of reach out to those kind of those tendrils uh, out, in, out in the internet and update. But then also, if you've got say 25 to 50 key sites that you must be on, go manually to those and update them. And those should be big sites like Yelp, should be industry sites to your industry, and all should also be local sites to your particular town and city. If you cover off, say, the top 25, 30 of those, then you've done 90% uh, of, the, of, the, of the effort and the work you can do in your citations. And then your citation burst service, would you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so well, our citation burst service can basically just do what it said. So, uh, we have a team of 50 people based in our office in the Philippines. Uh, all they do is citation work. Um, we work for about 1,000 agencies, about 5,000 local businesses, uh, and we do around 40 to 50,000 submissions a month. So we have a specialized team who go and build uh, your submissions or build your, your citations as well as update existing citations on around 1,500 sites. Uh, and we also, alongside that, have distribution apps for data aggregators. So if you want to take that kind of hybrid approach of, you know, of that huge widespread distribution through aggregators, and then also cherry pick the top sites and go direct. Our citation burst service can do both of those. All right, and then the one follow-up question I have to that, and then Robin has the follow-up question on the Yext is, you know, you, there's the list of top 50 citations that are in the citation tracker. Of those top 50, how many of those can the citation burst team handle, and then how many of them do we need to? Would a business owner need to do uh, for the for themselves or? Uh, an agency do on behalf of their client? Uh, I mean, we can pretty much do most of the ones that, that an agency could do. Uh, there are ones that are obviously locked down by yet, uh, and there are some that well, you can only reach through a data aggregator uh, submissions as well. So all the top sort of 50, there are about 35 uh, that we can do kind of direct for you. There are about five that are locked down by yet, and there are, I think, another, another handful who have got you know, other approaches to a to, to, to updating. Um, so of the time top 50, um, we can do 35. When you're thinking about your top 50 as a business, um, what you see in our citation tracker reports is kind of a generic top 50. You know, it's, a, it's the sites that cover off pretty much all industries and all towns. You also want to be looking at using local sites, so it could be local directories, or getting your business information onto, let's say, local news sites or local organizations sort of websites, because they have what's kind of known as location authority which really kind of enhances Google's understanding of where you're based. If you're linked to them, they can find your data on them. That kind of cements your location uh, in, uh, in Google's mindset, essentially. Uh, and then also industry sites. So there's always four or five decent sites for most industries. Maybe not dry cleaners. There's probably a few there that don't uh, have that much uh, uh, investment in terms of sites around them. But if you're in things like if you're a medical industry or in the legal industry or hotels, um, uh, cafes, pubs, Flores, etc. There are always a, uh, a decent number of good value, of good value and high authority um, industry citations that you should be on. So seek those ones out, seek out the local ones, and then look to cover off things like Yelp, uh, City Search, Yellow Pages, Insider Pages, um, those sorts of level of sites as well. Great, and and of the, all the different places that you have your citation burst team uh, go after, how many different uh, d directories? Uh, are, are people able to access through your citation burst service? So we have a, a, a database around 1,500, but for most people tend to order somewhere between uh, 25 and 75 through us. Um, if you were to say, just give me all of them, we'd probably end up maxing out around 200 um, because you'll, you'll find there are some existing listings that are fine. Uh, we wouldn't end up touching those. Uh, there'll be some sites that obviously you know, are kind of locked down, but yet you wouldn't touch those. So we tend to find that we max out around 200, but most people don't order 200 these days because we're moving from a quantity approach to a kind of quality approach uh, in citations. Great. Robin, you have a follow-up question on the uh, Yext? Well, in terms of just citations in general and duplicates, um, I've seen a lot of frustration from uh, local business owners that will complete their citations and then they'll go back and they'll see that the duplicates keep popping up. Uh, is there a way, I know it has something to do with uh, aggregating the data, but is there a way that you can prevent the duplicates from popping back up um, or uh, what's the best way to 
uh, use your time and, and get rid of these duplicates. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's the, it's the one thing about local search I think is just ridiculous. Is that we have this recurring problem in correct data. You thought that, you know, I mean, it feels like such a base problem to have, you know, where we should be tackling much more highbrow sort of intellectual issues, but all we're trying to do is, is make sure that we've got our basic location information right. Um, the problem is that if I'm a directory in the middle and I get my data from, say, four or five different places, I can, if a site comes along and it corrects it um, in, um, you know, at the kind of directory, that data still exists at the different sources that provide data into it. And so when the site gets a fresh dump of data or there's a fresh scrape, it can often re-pull back in uh, the listings that you've gone and kind of quashed before. Uh, so basically this site is not doing a good enough job of intelligently managing uh, its data. And to be really honest, there is no concrete solution to that now. It's just the sites need to kind of get better uh, at doing it. Or you've got to go and update your data far and wide as possible. That's what aggregators are good, because they push your data out far and wide. And what they don't always do is remove duplicate listings. What they can do is obviously push you know, the correct data uh, out to the kind of endpoints. As long as you've got the correct data pouring at all the, all the, all the endpoints, then that's certainly going to help you solve the problem at an individual directory level. Thank you, Miles. Uh, we have 10 minutes left in our uh, allotted time. I don't know if you're able to go past uh, uh, 11 Central. I know that's not the time that you're at right now. Uh, just wanted to get some feedback on that before I continue asking um, some more questions here. I could, probably do, I could probably do another 10 minutes. So let's say 20 minutes from now, and then I've got to uh, jump off. OK, all right, great. So. Um, uh, we have some of the other questions here. Uh, Yext was one of the big ones I wanted to ask, but let's take a look at some of the other ones here. Oh, new features coming to Bright Local in the next year or two. I'd love to know, you know, just get get an insight into what are some of the really cool, exciting things that you're looking to get done. Yeah, sure. So as I said earlier, you know, uh, you know, we see ourselves as really deepening our specialism uh, in uh, in local search. Um, we want to uh, do some improvements to the dashboard that we created. Uh, improve the functionality of that. We also want to develop a multi-location dashboard at the moment, rather than just a purely sort of single location. So, you know, if you're a five-location business or a five-thousand-location business, uh, you can get to see your reviews and your star rating at, say, an aggregate level. Break that down to a regional level, sort of sub-regional sort of, or a kind of town-based level. So, it's kind of taking that dashboard view uh, out to the kind of multi-location uh, uh, business uh, market. Uh, we're also doing a big overview and update um, of the designs and the interactivity of all the tools, adding some additional functionality, but making sure that the um, the reports look good, um, that they also render well on uh, on tablets uh, and mobile devices. Uh, we're going to be investing in doing some better tracking and auditing of Google My Business, so we're going to be integrating with the Google My Business API. Uh, we're hoping that they're hoping that Google will start to allow GMB Insights to be available with the API, so you can pull in that insights data to then sit alongside the GA data. And um, we're going to be building a uh, Google My Business duplicate um, uh, analysis uh, tool as well, looking to find out where all, where all the kind of duplicates for GMB listings uh, appear. And um, the next big thing uh, on, our, on our roadmap is basically to release um, a much more powerful citation uh, auditing and NAP uh, auditing um, uh, system. Essentially, at the moment, we rely a lot on uh, scraping engines like Google and Bing to find out where they've got listings as well as also gain direct sites. We spent the last six months doing a, a very large kind of scraping exercise where we've built up a database of, one, of over one billion uh, local directory listings, which gives us you know, an enormous, um, rich and detailed citation database covering around 500 sites. Um, we're starting to ingest that data uh, into our tools now so that we can use that when we're going and looking for citations and grabbing NAP data uh, from different directories. Our ambition is to be able to accurately report uh, on NAP information from a thousand sites um, across the web, which when you compare to someone like uh, a Yet, they do it on 40 sites, uh, and you know other services don't even, don't even report on NAP data. We want to get up to a, a bit, our ability to report on NAP data accurately on over 1,000 sites. And because we, we work kind of globally, it will primarily be the US and, and Canada, but it will also be UK, Australia, uh, and some other countries that we're rolling out to. Very cool, very cool. Uh, what are some of the different challenges that you've had with uh, growing from uh, where you started? How many years ago did you start uh, Bright Local? Uh, uh, nearly seven years ago. Okay. Seven years ago in November. 
That's the, my company's uh, just over six years old, so we started not not too not around the same time. So tell me, tell me how uh, some of the different challenges you've had with growth uh, over those seven years. Uh, well, the first three years uh, I did it part time, actually. So I uh, we never taken on any funding; we're entirely organic and grown, uh, just reinvesting the profits. So the first three years uh, I had a day job, uh, and I just uh, did it in the evenings. Uh, so the first challenge I had was. Um, uh, was how to do that and build it on a total boot, on total shoestring, uh, entirely kind of bootstrapped. Uh, and we got to the point where we were able to make enough money to reinvest it. I can go full time, uh, and then we functioned very much off a freelance team, a freelance kind of development team, freelance sort of support team, and we've slowly kind of built that out. And we're now about um, 70 people worldwide. We've got se uh, seven in the UK, 12 in the Ukraine, a learned team, uh, about th uh, two uh, in the US. Uh, and 50 kind of over in the Philippines. So a lot of it has been about kind of building out the infrastructure to kind of manage that wider team uh, and making sure that we didn't lose the focus um, on on what the kind of customers wanted and the understanding of what their needs were as we've grown. And today our, our challenges are kind of maintaining that growth uh, and ensuring that um, people have the same level of passion who come into business now um, than when we sort of started the business. You know, uh, it was just my, me and my business partner when we started, and so we're obviously incredibly passionate about it. Uh, you know, the first thing I do in the morning is check my phone to make sure that everything's working smoothly. The last thing I do at night is the same thing, much of the frustration of my uh, my wife. Um, so it's just about maintaining that kind of passion and interest and really not losing our focus on what's important, which is absolutely what our customers need. You know, I think um, a lot of big sort of software businesses can become quite sort of faceless, quite hard to kind of um, have decisions made that will impact and benefit one customer as opposed to benefiting all. You know, we always try and say yes when our customers ask us for, for, for help or features. Uh, we really do believe that our job and our mission is to make our customers, primarily agencies of freelancers, um, have an easier life and be better at bigger their job. So if you're a freelancer just setting out and you have an ambition to grow to be a bigger agency, our job is to provide a platform that's cost effective and gives you the data you need so you can do your job easily and quickly and focus on the tasks that will benefit your uh, your customers. So, again. Um, and it's about ensuring that we don't lose that. Uh, we don't lose that, that sort of personal touch uh, as we grow. So me as the CEO, that is what I, I'm trying to instill in everyone, is that even though we're, we're getting bigger um, and we've got more people, that is still all about the customers and you know one individual's customer's needs shouldn't be ignored just because it doesn't meet the rest of the um, the rest of you know our customers' needs. Sometimes we have to make decisions around kind of priority. Um, but if now one customer comes to us and says, "I really need this. Can you help me out?" We'll do whatever we can do within our reasonable powers to do that for them. Awesome. Uh, it's, uh, it sounds like your next meeting is trying to get a hold of you here. So uh, <laughs> if you if you have time for more question, uh, yes, I'd love to do that. Sure, you want to do, yeah. do one more, and then I want to do a wrap up with a again a promo of. Uh, how to how to get a hold of you and, and okay, as well. Great. So, uh, I think I'm going to go with the uh, Robin actually wrote out a question here on our shared Google Doc, which is, um, you know, everyone uses like the Google Keyword Planner. Uh, we use Market Samurai uh, to do some keyword research, and uh, yeah, you know, there's a, a whole variety of different techniques uh, to look for. Uh, just keywords, long tail keywords, and, and and using that data to be confident about which choices we should make. Just wanted to know if you had any insight uh, on on you know just trying to find those perfect keywords for your business uh, because I, I I would imagine you do. And I think there's a lot there's a lot of information sort of out there uh, about it. I mean certainly um, yeah we use a number of kind of keyword tools. Uh, some of the ones that you mentioned. Uh, when analyzing which kind of keywords that we should be targeting. Um, I think it's about understanding your, your audience first and also if you're working on a client, so understanding their kind of product range, making you understand the language that customers are using uh, when they are kind of looking for a particular business. Um, obviously as we move from an age of kind of keyword based search into more natural language, semantic search, um, that approach is going to change quite significantly. You know, and you know, things like the growth of voice search as an aspect of kind of the growth of mobile, the so more people are using voice search to kind of um, uh, to do the sort of search results. There's going to be even more of a movement towards um, uh, kind of natural language uh, and content that uses natural language to answer some sorts of questions um, that people are speaking into their phones or typing into into their kind of keyboard. So I think that's going to change a lot of the best practices that uh, that people have. 
Um, obviously, you want to be targeting terms that have the right balance between volume and intent. So I think that often gets looked um, in keyword research. We tend to focus on um, volume and ease uh, of you know ranking for particular terms. But I think the intent of the customer is almost the most important thing. For example, let's choose an obvious one, credit cards. Tom puts credit cards into a search engine. Who knows what they're looking for? I mean, you know, the possible uh, directions they may take for that are enormous. But if someone puts in, I need a new credit card with low credit transfer costs, bingo. You know exactly what you want. They know what they want. And all they're looking for is the best option, and they're going to kind of go with it. So it's, un it's looking at the keywords and saying, okay, which of these are going to convert more? Because you know you can get a thousand visits to your website, but if they're irrelevant and the people leave, then they were no value to you anyway. But if you get five high-value um, leads and three of them turn into kind of contacts and customers, then that's so much more important and more valuable for the business in terms of its bottom line and generating revenue. So I think, as well as that kind of data in terms of you know keyword volume, competitiveness that you get out of these tools, you also need some human analysis to understand what is that customer thinking about. How likely are they to convert? You know, what's the intent of the search that they're uh, that they're doing? And I think for those of us in this industry, uh, as human beings working in this industry, which is being slowly encroached upon by uh, um, you know, automations and technology, that's the one area um, that we're going to maintain a distinct advantage over computers for some time. Yeah, it, it's funny you mentioned that intent to search because that's the one piece of the keyword research we just need. We we need to know uh, from from our client in many cases what is the intent behind this? Are they looking to buy something from you? Are they looking to learn about something that you do, which doesn't necessarily lead to a sale, or is it completely irrelevant? And those are we we score it a zero, one, or two. Zero not relevant. One very, and two could be either way, might be good blog content or something, uh, but you know, for your main services, we're really looking for the, the keyword with the intent to buy, with that intention behind it. So that's, yeah. uh, that's kind of the way we look at it, and we have to work with our clients very closely to make sure we get that uh, distinction down for each of the different keywords that, that we're looking at. You know, there's thousands and thousands of things that are relevant. You know, which ones of these should I start with? Yes, exactly. You do have to be focused about it, otherwise you end up, um, you know, throwing mud around and, and, and not really kind of getting the uh, that kind of combination of good traffic uh, and conversion that you need. Excellent. So at this point, we're going to wrap it up. Miles, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate you uh, spending a little bit of time with us to give us your insights, not only on some generic SEO questions, but also uh, giving us insight into what Bright Local is doing today and what's coming up in the future. And I think it's uh, an exciting future uh, for, for your, your business and a lot of us agencies that are out there are looking forward to those different uh, uh, improvements in your software uh, and offerings uh, coming up soon. I, I, I just can't uh, express how uh, pleased I am with everything that you guys do uh, and, and how much it really enhances our offerings to our SEO clients. So with that, I'd like you to go ahead and close with uh, well anything that you'd like to say, followed by, again, how to reach out to you and contact you so they can get uh, in touch with Bright Local to do some business with you. Okay, well, Paul, thank you very much. Um, I always enjoy uh, talking with our customers and talking about local search. It's uh, uh, two things that are very close to my heart as a business owner uh, and uh, you know, someone who works in the local uh, SEO industry. Um, for anyone who hasn't tried Bright Local, who's tried us and wants some more information, uh, two email addresses to get a hold of us, contact at brightlocal.com or miles, which is M-Y-L-E-S, at brightlocal.com, uh, or contact us through our, our chat function on the website. Uh, we're also delighted to hear from our customers. We're more than happy to... Uh, to kind of answer any questions you've got, or if you've got any suggestions or improvements, uh, please let us know. Uh, we have a pretty rapid turnaround in terms of uh, rolling out new features, and we've got a very busy uh, development pipeline with some really, really uh, good, interesting, and also fun improvements, uh, which will make you know the lives of our customers uh, a lot better. But ultimately, as a business, we are here to serve you. We're here to help you um, be better at your jobs, give you information so you can work with your customers quicker, faster. Uh, spend less time, uh, you know, tracking data and auditing data. Uh, so anything that we can do to help you in that respect, we want to. So please let us know. 
Thank you so much, Miles. And my name is Paul DeWarian from Awesome Dynamic. You can check out our website, awesomedynamic.com. Uh, you can also reach my director of sales, Terry, at awesomedynamic.com, T-E-R-R-Y. Uh, you are also able to give us a call on the phone, 800-238-1811. That's 800-238-1811. We'd love to hear from you. Terry will be the guy that will take your call, and we'll get you taken care of right away. Thank you so much, Miles. I really appreciate everything uh, that you've done for us today and answering all these questions and giving us your time uh, on this webinar and, and video. And I'm sure we're going to get a lot of folks that will uh, want to uh, just just really get some insight into what you think about the world of SEO. So I appreciate that today. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Thanks a lot, guys, as well. Really appreciate it. Really enjoyed it. All right.